Beth Rudden, CEO and co-founder of a startup, Bast AI, in building explainable AI. I learned that phrase from watching her videos, Beth's videos, and also reading a book. AI, for the rest of us, it's a must read. Um, Beth Rodden is an anthropologist, and maybe that's the aspect of her that I really enjoy the most when she comes to technological problems from an anthropological approach. Um, she talks about the context. You know, understanding data without understanding the context is meaningless, and she's come to us here in Cupertino, all the way from Colorado. Beth Rodden. So Beth, your book is one of my favorites. It's, it's a short book, it's an easy read, and it's very practical. It's very, very approachable. So help our audience understand what made you write this book, but not before you tell us something about yourself, because it's the person that connects us to the work of the person. Thank you so much for having me. And um, I actually wrote this book because my co-author, Phaedra Boinaderas, made me. Um, <laughs> uh, and I, I think you know one of the things that I learned, um, and I spent 25 years at IBM, the last seven years as a technical executive, was that a career is something that you can look back on. It's very difficult to plan when you're in it. And it didn't, it, it, it took me about two decades to connect back to my roots. And I did, um, I won the lottery with my parents. They told me to go to school for what I loved. So I went and became an archeologist, um, realized I was not independently wealthy, <laughs> and uh, sold out and became a programmer. And that's how I started at IBM. <laughs> um, I actually went to school with a lot of MBAs that I ended up making far more money than. Anyway, I digress. But what, what I loved about writing the book and what I really saw in my career at IBM was, and, and we, started, we started thinking about everyday ethics in design back in 2013. We actually published a, a guide for everyday ethics in 2017. And it started with the, the fuel of what makes artificial intelligence and data. And I ran around the world, because I was a trained anthropologist, asking everybody I knew, data scientists, data engineers, data analysts, what is data? And I got so many different answers. And nobody had a common definition of data. So being a good anthropologist, I declared it. And I said, <laughs> data is an artifact of human experience. And that started the, the conceptual model of data information, knowledge, and wisdom. And reframing that to understand that some human being either created the data or they created the system that creates the data. And when you are in the weeds of building information systems and understanding how to transform data, you as an engineer, you're making so many choices. And like Safia referred to, those choices are, are often excluding things that don't fit. And that's a huge problem because we don't have a representative sample. And if we want a representative sample of humanity, we need two billion human beings being able to write and understand how to design artificial intelligence systems. So when we wrote the book, it was published in May of 23, we really wanted to declare to the world and honestly to our children that there's an alternative way to be able to build artificial intelligence without using large volumes of data and large amounts of compute. And I asked the question to my audience a lot, who benefits from everyone in the world believing that artificial intelligence requires large amounts of data and large amounts of compute? I think, 
I think we are all at a stage where, and Amy Webb said this, I was um, on the stage at South by Southwest EDU this year, and Amy Webb did her futures report, which people line up to go see, and she said that there are scramblers and there are ostriches. And that is a really good way to define all of the different changes that are coming at us that feel like whiplash about artificial intelligence. And what I want is I want people to understand and I want people like me who are technologists building technology to be able to explain in simple terms how it got the result that it got or what data was used or what weights and measures were chosen or what was the intent behind the AI model or what was the intent to be able to build this and did you do the layers of effect to understand the disparate impact that you would have when somebody uses the model in a production system? And these are all hard questions, but they're not impossible. And everyone should be able to use AI that they can trust and that they can trust is not harvesting their data to be able to sell them more things or outrage them to engage them with their phones. <laughs> <laughs> I just got a little prompt that I need to get moving on the time. So, Beth, I'm going to combine, you know, I was wanting to get a sense of what you're currently working on, but I also want to bring it back to the community colleges because this is our conference, and to see how some of the ideas that you put forward of working in a smaller context mm -hmm. and utilizing AI tools more individually and in community how do you see that being put to work within the California community colleges? So I love community colleges um, because uh, California community colleges are, are your feeder systems to all of your universities as well as to all of, all of the industry. And what I'm very interested in is giving people the fishing pull the, the tackle kit, the ability to understand how to build artificial intelligence using their own data. And when we're, we're doing what we're doing using you know, old school information systems like knowledge graphs in order to be able to understand how things relate to one another or logic to be able to understand how things are, are actually reasoned against. And I find that when you are showing your work and you have an AI system that is explaining itself, human beings are like, oh, I want to put my data in it. I want to experiment with it. And um, I heard you mention librarians um, earlier. And I do a lot of work with librarians because they, they, they already curate the information in your local places. And so I imagine a world where we have local order because that's how we create new ideas and new concepts is to have enough order in the same language so that we can all understand how to, how to start from where we are. And I think that you know, the, the exciting projects that I'm working on with BAST is we are doing the really hard work to understand the problems that people have and the data that is needed to, use, to be used to solve those problems. And I use um, Conrad Wolfram, who is a teacher. He says that there are three steps to a mathematical process. Step number one, understand the problem in the real world. Step number two, go into the, the mathematical world and perform a calculation or create an algorithm or create a model. And then step number three, come back into the real world and see if you've actually solved that problem. The current data scientists suck at one and three. <laughs> <laughs> and we need more different types of, I always say, a diverse set of neocortexes. We need difference in understanding what are those problems, what is the data that is necessary to either be created or to be used to solve the problem, and then how do we get people to trust a system, and I think that you have to get the system to explain itself. And if we value attribution, and we value taking something from something that we love and then remixing it and making it something that is useful for today, 
we need to give attribution and we need to model this. And I think that community colleges especially can model using artificial intelligence that explains itself and shows its work because that's what you value. And that's how we teach people, my children, sorry, my children do, do, do what I do. They don't do what I say. And on that note, <laughs> do as I do and not do as I say. Let's give it up for Beth Whiting.